Coming up, we're going to answer the question, how do you know who has the influence in any room? Who's a real influencer? And then record CEO turnover. We're going to dive into why and how influence could fix it. Let's go. Welcome to the Ken Coleman Show. We're here to help you grow personally, advance professionally, and lead effectively, if that's you. So, do you want to be the one who's really got the influence in any situation? Some of you immediately are going, no way, man. I don't want anybody looking at me. And that's fair. So, if that's not you, you still need to learn about this. Because you may not want to be the most influential person in the room, but there are times where you need to be. How about that? And this is going to have a personal and professional application. How do you know who the most influential person in the room is? And then what do you learn from that? We're going to walk through that. Because there are times where you need to be the most influential person in the room. And there are times where you find yourself over and over, you are. And influence is not something that is limited to leadership, a leadership position. Becoming a person of influence is vitally important for all of us, just different applications. So let's answer the question. How do you know? Like, how do we spot influence? So I remember doing a day-long consulting gig several years ago. It was for a company. And uh, it was going to be an all-day thing. And so when we had talked about the arrangements, I said, hey, um, I would love if we could go to dinner the night before with the senior leaders. And, of course, they agreed, and so that's what we did. And so uh, the, the three leaders came, and, and they brought their spouses, and it was me and, uh, and, and one of my teammates that was with me. And so uh, we all sat there. Now, the uniqueness of this company was is that um, they had three leaders – across the top, okay? Three ladies, and and all three of them were equal partners in the business, okay? So on paper, equal rank, but it did not take long to be going through just the natural discourse of the meal that I saw what was really happening. There was a very clear dynamic going on. There was one lady that was the clear influencer of the group. She was, this was the first sign, the person that the other two would look at first when I'd ask a question. So, you know, I'm just getting to know them, and I would ask a question about the business because, again, we were trying to get just kind of a nice overview before we spend a day together with their team, and I would facilitate some things, and I would ask a question that was broadly applied to all three. After all, all three equal partners in the company. But every time I'd ask a question the other two ladies would instinctively glance at her, even turn their bodies towards her. It was a body language, you know, red light flashing. She was the one that was swaying the opinions at the table. Now, there were times where the other two might have a different point of view. There was never any real disagreement because this is a healthy company, very successful company, and they're crushing it. So there's no tension, but it was very obvious that she had the most influence. Now, for those of you who want more influence, for those of you that there's going to come a time in your life where you need some influence, I'm going to walk you through right now. I'm going to tell you how you gain influence. There's six actions that you can start doing today to increase your influence. But first, before I get to those six actions, I want to clarify the type of influence we're talking about. This is healthy. This is not manipulative. This, this is coming from a transformational effect on people for good. So transformation is I am helping transform a set of opinions and then maybe some actions. That's for good. It's not an unhealthy influence that is based on having authoritative um, influence or an intimidating effect on people where they're just cowering. There's a transformation in that. That's manipulation. So transformational influence is much more sustainable and much more powerful. So there are six things you can start doing today to build transformational influence. Number one, you've got to be self. 
You got to be you got to be self-aware. Self-awareness. How do we do this? You got to dedicate. You got to dig. You got to dedicate the time to do the digging to figure out how you're wired, right? We talk about this methodology on this show all the time. What am I really good at doing? What do I love to do? And what results mean a lot to me? I want to produce these results. What's my personality? What are the needs I have? Triggers. Self-awareness. That is enormous for influence. Here's why. When I am self-aware, I now have the ability to be authentic. That's number two. You know, you cannot be authentic if you yourself are confused about who you are. You might have some authentic flashes, some authentic moments, but you can't be authentic until you're completely self-aware. So when you get self-awareness, now it's, okay, this is who I am, and now I'm going to be me. I'm not going to try to be a knockoff version of somebody else. I'm not going to be a complete imposter. I'm going to be me. I'm going to be transparent, and I'm going to be vulnerable, and as a result, watch, authentic, and now people respect authenticity. So these build on each other. Awareness leads to the ability to be authentic, but I must be authentic. And now all of a sudden I'm starting to get some influence because people go, that's the genuine article. That's the real deal. I respect that. May not like it, may not agree with it, but I respect it. Three, you've got to be a great listener. Don't listen to hear. Listen to understand. Don't listen to gather information so that you can make your next point. Listen to understand. This is huge. Just because you could repeat everything that I said to you in a conversation doesn't make you a good listener. If you don't understand and you can't get some context as to why I said what I said, then you are not a good listener. For years and years and years, I've had to craft this ability when I would interview and still do interviews for the show and for events. I've got to listen for understanding. And and when a guest or my wife or my kids or a coworker or a customer feels as though I am understanding them, then they connect to me. They allow the connection. I don't force the connection on anybody. So when I listen and understand and they go, he gets me, he's understanding, he's not trying to debate me, he's not trying to win, he's just asking to understand where I'm coming from. Woo, man. This gives you a chance to influence somebody because there's safety there. Number four, be a cheerleader. Never hold back praise. If you can think of praise in the moment, give them praise. If you want to praise them about something specifically, don't go to bed that night without sharing that praise. People are drawn to those who encourage them who affirm them, who cheer for them, who celebrate them. Man, now listen, you got to be careful. I'm just going to call this out on this one. You have to be careful not to manipulate people by cheering for them because it can it, it can be inauthentic. You got to be careful. And you got to be careful to be wary of somebody who's trying to manipulate you through praise. This needs to be authentic. Back to action number two. Number five, be a connector. If you know two people should meet, work together, just might get along, connect them. People are going to start to respect your kindness in connecting. They're going to respect your instincts to go, I saw that you two need to know each other. Go, go over here and uh, tell me what, what goes on. I'm excited. And, and and people will begin to seek your advice on who they should be connected to. Uh, let me tell you some of the most influential people in the world. They're the great connectors. They're not the mar- the smartest person in the room, but they're connectors. And and people that are just, hey, hey I'll connect you over here. I'll connect you over here. I'll connect you over here. Let me tell you something. Great influence. And then six, be a servant. Again, this is not limited to leadership, but certainly has great leadership application. But be a servant. Serve others. The more I serve others, it fosters a connection. It fosters loyalty. It's going to come back to you. And all of a sudden, you are so influential because you're admired. So in closing, a boss is just a title. A leader has the people. That was 
uttered by Simon Sinek. It's powerful. A boss has the title. A leader has the people. How? Influence. If you want to be a real leader, you need to be able to influence people. Influence is the currency that we all should long for. Influence in our relationships. Influence in our work. Let me tell you something. You want to see transformation in your own life? Look at who influences you. Is that good or bad influence? Watch who's influencing you. And then you want to see transformation in the meaning and in the results of your life. Who do you want to influence and how will you influence them? Influence is the gold to getting the life that you want. Work on it. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, folks, I want to tell you about one of our viewers, Nick. He was a high school chemistry teacher, not making enough for his wife to stay home with their kids like they wanted, and he needed a change. A friend told him about a tech job, and a few days later, Nick also heard about Bethel Tech and their full-stack development program on this show. So he enrolled. He got in, he crushed it, he got hired before he even finished, and now, ready for this, makes $20,000 $20,000 more with opportunities to make up to $150,000. So what does your life look like a year from now if you were to move into tech? Will you bet on yourself like Nick did? For as little as $5,000 in just 15 weeks of your time, you can learn a skill that will land you a great job in tech. And remember, Ken Coleman viewers get a 10% discount. To find out more, go to BethelTech.net slash Ken Coleman. Hey, folks, thanks for being here. However, you're here watching or listening. If you uh, are here and you are, we just established that. Would you help us grow? You can do that uh, by giving us a thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube, subscribing to our channel, and uh, sharing the video that you think might. Uh, encourage or help someone else. And then if you were listening via your favorite podcast app, give us a follow and a five-star review. I would be very, very grateful for that. Okay. Um, we're going to carry this issue of influence into the real world. Let's carry this, this topic of influence into the headlines and then specifically in the world of uh, professional growth, leadership growth. Let, let's take this issue and let's just look at some things that um, I think we see in the headlines. And this, this article really illustrates the uh, complexity of the world of work today, the complexity of leadership in today's environment, and then where does influence, where can we apply that as a lens for a solution to the complexity in the world of leadership in the world of work today? Uh, This is an article from Business Insider, and um, they they are citing some data um, from PwC. And this was released at Davos. This is the big World Economic Forum now in Davos, Switzerland. And uh, this was at the first of the year. This was a quote from the article from Tim Ryan, who's a PwC senior partner. He said, we will see more turnover in the C-suite, these are executives, in the next 12 months than we have ever. Um, He compared the role of a CEO right now to playing a multi-dimensional game of chess. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. He goes on to say, being a CEO is a massively complex job. You have investors who want something in the short term. The board is thinking about the short term and the long term. You have employees that are worried, concerned. You're worried about leaving behind. Am I going to be able to retain them? Rising regulations. Technology is evolving at a breakneck speed. And so he goes on to say, as a CEO, you've got to reinvent yourself. And I'm going to, I'm going to slightly and respectfully disagree that I I don't think it's about reinventing all the time. I think reinvention is a major move and I think does happen and should happen. However, I think you have to reshape yourself, be a shape shifter. And maybe that's what he means by reinvent. But reinvent to me is I was this and now I'm this. And shape-shifting is I'm this in this meeting. 
I'm this in this meeting. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie X Men, but one of the X Men characters, and I, I forget the name of the character, doesn't matter. But you know, she is. Uh, I think she's played by Rebecca Romaine in the first one. And she's blue, and she's a shapeshifter. That's the bottom line. And there's others that are shapeshifters, right? And so they can just kind of like, I'm this guy, and then I'm that guy, and 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 I think that's the metaphor I want us to hang on to, despite the creepy blue skin and the creepy cat eyes that she has. Mystique, thank you, Nathan. I knew one of you were going to hit me with that. All right? So I want you to have that image in your mind. If you are a CEO, and, and even if you are a, like, this is this is not limited to CEOs. There's a leadership application here because we're talking about influence. And at the end of the day, if you've got a leadership title and you can't influence the people that you're uh, leading for good, I got news for you. You're not technically a leader. You just have a title, but you're not legit. You're just not. If you are in a leadership position and you are influencing people for the negative, I'm going to give you a bold label. You're a dictator. That's what I'll call you. So let's look at this. Back to the quote. Tim Ryan compared the role of a CEO, and I think we could say the role of a leader, even in small business. I don't think this is limited to big-time CEOs. I really don't. He, he he compared the role to playing a multi-dimensional game of chess. And remember, he's now, we're talking big business, so he's talking about investors, so stockholders, you know, fickle, hey, am I going to invest today? Am I going to sell tomorrow? The board, which is essentially the bosses, the collective bosses of a CEO at that high level, the employees, market regulatory issues coming from Congress or your state government, all these things, and then technology. And so what he is describing and laying out for us in detail is a very complex situation. And I like the analogy of the multidimensional chess game. Now, I don't know if any of you have played chess before or it's been a long time or you play all the time, but if we can imagine now a chess game and you've got all these different pieces on the board, your your pawns, and then you start to go down from the side, you come in, you got your rooks, you got your knights, or some people call it a castle, knights, and then you got your bishops. And you got the queen and the king. All right. And so those are so all these pieces on the board occupying squares on the chessboard. We get this. And all of those pieces move in different ways. So the game of chess itself has got some complexity going on due to the multiple pieces move different ways. Oh, yeah. And I'm competing against someone else. And by the way, in the game of chess, a move I make can dictate a move that the other player makes. Okay. So I think we all are there. Feels very much like business. Okay. And as the player of the chess game, okay, in this analogy, as the leader or a top leader, you are the one making the moves. I'm going to move my pawn up to here. Over here, I'm going to move the pawn once. Then I'm opening up a spot for the knight to move over. You are making the moves in leadership. So it's a wonderful analogy. Now, that's just the one game. The multi-dimensional is, I got a game here. I'm playing against this guy. Over here, I'm playing against this gal. And I've got multiple chess games going on. So it really is beautiful and rich to kind of go, this is essentially what a leader's got going on. From a publicly held company, you know, a Fortune 100 company, all the way down to a small business that has 15 employees. The leader, the CEO, the president, the, the, the head honcho is playing multidimensional chess games. I'm, I'm making moves with my, my talent, acquisition and retention, people, my people. I'm making moves over here with healthcare or cutting my costs and trying to get the best situation for my employees, but also I'm, I, I got to cut costs here. I, I'm, I'm making moves over here on my inventory and my vendors. I'm making moves over here with my customer. So this is, this is business. And so 
in that situation where you are playing a multi-dimensional chess game, and I love this analogy, he's saying there are a lot of leaders that are going, I'm out. It's too much. I want to play one chess game. I don't think that's realistic, but they could be saying they're going, it's too much. I'm multidimensional. I'm over here. I'm over here. I'm over here. And I'm, I'm, I'm not able to keep up. And, and, and the, the, the very tension that comes with having to play multiple chess games or wear multiple hats is too much for them. So they're going, I'm out. Now, it's important to point out here before I go any further that leadership at any level is not for everybody. It's just not. Can anybody lead? Yes. Can anybody lead effectively? I take issue with that and say no. Because if you're not cut out for it, you don't want it, you can't You can't do it effectively. Now, if you change your mind and your attitude and you say, hey, I want to do it, then, then, then yes, in fact, you can learn to lead effectively. But let's go back to our opening topic today of influence. So can you apply influence into a complex leadership role, and all leadership roles are essentially complex. So the, what I've been describing in the last few minutes, how does influence, and let's look at influence as a soft skill, because I believe it is. How can we apply this tool, this skill of influence, and apply it to a complex leadership situation for the purposes of simplifying? Because let's let's just say this today. Effective leadership is defined by one thing, the ability to take complex situations and lead a team to a simplistic resolution. That's how I would define effective leadership. Okay? Now, so that means you have to understand as a leader that it's not all on you. The whole thing does not ride on you. So we take influence and we say, wait a second. When I'm in this chess game, when I'm over here with vendors, how do I sit with my team and help influence them? They're the subject matter expert. I'm not, but I'm the leader. How do I help influence them to make the best decision, the right decision? And you can repeat that over and over again. Remember, influence is not expertise. Influence is the ability to come in, be authentically you, serve and in doing so, empower others to make the best decision, and you influence that through empowerment, confidence, clarity, all the things. So back to just the simple idea here is the key to managing and leading in complexity is influence. Gather the facts, be a calming influence, be a confident influence, be a strong influence, be an innovative influence, be an imaginative influence, be a creative influence. I could go on and on and on, but understanding influence as the power and then how to apply it is the key to leading through complexity into simplistic solutions. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. Thrilled to have you with us. The phone number, if you want to jump in, is 844-747-2577. You'll leave a voicemail if you don't get us, and we'll try to get you on the show. Let's go to Hannah now in Cleveland, Ohio. Hannah, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. What's going on today? So I um, am trying to figure out what my next step is. I'm not currently making enough at my job to make ends meet. Mm-hmm. So I know that I need to get any job in the, in the, um, as soon as possible okay. to bring in more money. But I don't know, like looking at it from a career lens, like what my next step should be. Okay. Well, um, let's get into the immediate. And then I think solving the immediate will help us figure out what our steps are for the future. Okay. Mm-hmm. So how much are you making right now? Um, so I manage a library and I make 2,400 a month. Okay. Salary. All right. And do you have debt? I do. How much? 
Um, all together, it's probably just under like ninety eight thousand. Ninety eight thousand, um, and roughly, I'm not gonna. I don't need to know the super specifics here, but roughly, what does that $98,000 in debt cost you per month? Meaning, if you combine all of those payments, what's that costing you? Um, well, right now, I'm behind 1400 on my student loans. Um, usually, they're about 550 a month. Right, and but then, I'm just saying, give me a total yeah. ballpark of just student loans is 550 What else? <clears throat> what's our total? Probably just under a thousand with credit card debt. So combined, altogether. so credit card plus student loan, you're paying about five a thousand dollars a month. Probably, yeah, in okay. that neighborhood. Which is leaving you fourteen hundred. Is that take home twenty four hundred a month? Yes, that's okay. net. Okay, gotcha. So okay, I just wanted to have a picture of why this is not enough money, and that's that's the reason right there. But mm -hmm. the, the more money we can make and we pay off that debt, then obviously all of a sudden we give ourselves a $1,000 raise. You with me? Yes. All right. So there's a couple ways to go at this. One is we go and we we, we pick our long-term destination or direction. That's that's kind of career path, obviously. And, mm -hmm. and we start going after that. Um, but before we do that, we got to know, A, what it is. And then what's it going to take to get qualified, how much that's going to cost, and as a result of that, how long it's going to take. So we'll get to that. So depending on what it is, you know, there are some steps to take. And so that's a focus on the next. But right now, we need another, at a minimum, $1,000 a month coming in, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, because the $1,000 a month would would just pay your minimums, but, but what we then would go, okay, Shoo, be nice if we had another two, three grand coming in a month so that I'm paying, let's say, at another, let's say, two grand coming in. I'm covering, I'm putting an extra thousand. So 12,000 a year. And so now I'm looking at, okay, what's it going to take for me to pay the 98,000 off at 12,000 a year? That's going to take a while. Yeah. Okay. That's not fast enough. So, you know, you're in the long haul here to pay off the loan, but paying off the credit cards would also be a huge deal. And make some room for mm -hmm. you. So, um, short term, if I'm you, um, I'm doing anything and everything. You know, if I can go work at Walmart and make twenty five bucks an hour, I'm not saying you can, but I'm looking at. I'm going to look at that and go, that's a lot more than what I'm making now, right? Yes, yeah. So I'm open to anything, and I think that's part of my problem. Um, I don't think that's a problem I, right now because here's where I'm okay. going. I would take anything right now, depending on what we're going to cover next. And, mm -hmm. and so let, let's spend a little bit of time on what, what it is we think you want to do long term. I think we can do that. But, but what I'm saying is once we figure that out, we may have to do anything right now just to simply get margin and get momentum while because we're going to have to cash flow potentially the qualification process. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. great. So if I were to ask you right now, just for fun, let's simplify it. What would you try tomorrow if you knew you didn't have to commit the rest of your life to it and a bunch of money, but it was all free and I got you qualified and we just said, we're going to spend 30 days doing this to see if Hannah would love to do this for long-term play. What would you, what would you ideate? What would you go, well, I might try this or might try that. What comes to the top of your mind? Uh, my dream is always to write books. Okay, great. So let's let's pull back because writing books, I can tell you, the guy who's written three, well, fourth one's coming out soon. Uh, it's a lot harder than it looks, and it's also mm -hmm. it's also a lot harder to make money writing books. That's a that is a long process. Not saying you can't do it. Not saying you shouldn't do it. But let's pull back from that and go. Okay, we know that you love to write, correct? Yes. And do you have any evidence that you're good at writing? Um, I have a degree in English. I did work at a magazine and a little bit in book publishing for 18 months, um, but not within the last five years. That's okay. I don't really have a portfolio. Have you, that's okay. But have you written stuff before at any point in your life where people who weren't your friends or your family members said, this is really good? Oh, yes. Great. So we have evidence mm -hmm. that you're good at this. This is not like me trying to play NBA basketball. That'd be a bad move, don't you think? 
Come on, Hannah. It there's be. no evidence. It might be. No, come on. I'm five foot nine and I can't jump, and I'm 49. There's no evidence right now that says to Ken he should pursue playing NBA basketball. You get the drill. So we yeah. know you've got it. We've got some talent that we can develop. Okay. So mm-hmm. what what is what is on the ladder if staff writer in a small writing position or copywriter or whatever is at the lower end of the ladder and being a published best selling author is at the very top? What's in between there? where you could make a good income that would potentially allow you the freedom in your life because you're not stressed out for bills and everything and you go all right I'm going to write a book and I'm going to I'm going to submit it and see if it goes what's mm-hmm. what's that ladder look like well my guess would be marketing or technical writing or yep. yeah script writing for yeah you just um, you just content. laid out three there you go the point is there's a lot of ways that you can get paid to write. Yeah. So with your English degree, I would say that you, you're you at entry level now, qualification-wise, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. So you've got to start looking. All right. Um, all those different types of writers, what do they pay? What are the qualifications that I need to get into those? Aha. So I mean, so now I'm looking at entry level. In order to get to this writing role, I need X amount of years in this lower level writing role, or let's call it beginner, or, you know, entry level. And so now you begin to see a map. Now let's go to the very end of it. Would you like to be a best-selling author one day and totally live off of what you're writing? That would be ideal. Okay, what kind of stuff would you be writing? Fiction, nonfiction, self-help? What are we talking about? Uh, fiction, probably. Okay, great. Who are your favorite fiction writers? Um, I like sci-fi. Sci-fi. And, yeah. Do you have your favorites, though? I do. Good. Um, so I would be digesting yeah. all of their stuff. Have they ever done anything, a podcast interview, talking about their writing style? Do they put stuff out? Like, you need to become an expert in your favorite writers. When I started out early on, I started watching the best interviewers in the world to learn how to interview, and I just digested everything, and I learned so much. And that was me learning on the side and also developing my own style. And I'm telling you, you need to be doing that now so that uh, on the side, you're growing, you're trying, you're innovating, you're putting your work out there, you're showing your work, and maybe one day you become that. But if you love writing, then I would try to work in writing. Even though it's not fiction writing, you, you are gaining the skills and someone else is paying you to become a better writer. That would be the direction I would try to go in the midterm, all right? Mm -hmm. So while you're doing that research, you need to be working two and three and four jobs to just give yourself some breathing room. That's my advice. Does that make sense? Would you recommend freelance at all? Yeah, freelance all you can. I don't care how you work or where you work. You need some more work right now, and and that is the game. So hang on the line. I'm going to give you my, my assessment, the Get Clear assessment. I'm going to give you the book from Paycheck to Purpose, and I'm going to give you the Proximity Principle. It's your toolkit to getting where you want to go. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.